The old saying that the flame that burns twice as bright burns twice as fast is perhaps twice as true in Hollywood. The world of show business is full of shining stars who have briefly illuminated stage and screen before leaving us too soon. The names of actors like James Dean and River Phoenix have passed into mythology, their talent and beauty immortalized in the movies they left behind. Tragically, on January 22, 2008, another name was added to the list of movie stars who have passed away before reaching their 30th birthdays. His name was Heathcliff Andrew Ledger, and he had just completed the most hotly anticipated role of his career as the Joker in The Dark Knight. His brilliance, his, um, how kind he, he, he is, um, how much he loved his character, how much he prepared for it, his, um, the courage it took for him to, um, to play the role, and um, the time I got to spend with him, it, um, it will be always, I'll cherish that memory. He was just, you know, absolutely free in a way that is incredibly unusual, even for the greatest actors, and I, you know, it's, it's thrilling working with someone who's in that place and contagious, and I had a wonderful time working with him. He immersed himself completely. He had just a fantastic time making this movie. I did too with him. You know, we very much enjoyed watching each other, our performances, the immersion in it. He's created a, this anarchic, Sid Vicious-like uh, punk rock uh, Joker, unlike any Joker that's been seen before. I think it's a real uh, classic portrayal that will be remembered for ages. Heath Ledger had never had trouble being remembered, even at the very beginning of his career. Thanks to his heartthrob good looks, he found early success in soaps like Aussie drama Home and Away, after moving to Sydney from his hometown of Perth while still in his teens. In a foretaste of things to come, Heath even played a troubled gay cyclist in the ill-fated sporting drama Sweat. He caught the eye of Australian director Gregor Jordan, who cast him opposite screen veteran Brian Brown in the crime caper Two Hands. The film was a success both in Australia and overseas. Hollywood sat up and took notice, and he was snapped up to sing, dance and act opposite teen queen Julia Stiles in the comedy Ten Things I Hate About You. Other roles quickly followed, including a chance for Heath to work with one of his childhood heroes, fellow Aussie Mel Gibson on The Patriot. Oh, he's a national hero, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, he does, and, and never in a million years did I imagine that I'd be working with him, um, you know. Of course, I grew up, you know, watching all these movies, Mad Max and Gallipoli, and, and uh, you know, I tell you what, you know, he was the guy who bridged bridge the gap between the two industries for us, so, you know, he's a man. <laughs> Another period piece followed, this time a comedy. Heath spent several months in Prague filming the rollicking hit A Knight's Tale. The film struck box office gold and Heath found himself scaling Hollywood Heights at a rate even he hadn't foreseen. I, I, I guess not, I don't know, I don't know if you imagine it, I, you, don't, you know, you just... I don't know, you just strive for your next job and that's it, and that takes you to here, you know? And that's really it, I don't know, I, I never really had one goal, I never, you know? But even at this early stage in his career, the young actor had his eyes on the bigger picture and was determined to become much more than a Hollywood heartthrob. I have made a conscious effort to kind of slow down my career in a way. I mean, I had an opportunity to take other paths, but I just, you know, and once you're on top, there's only one way one place to go, so I don't really want to be there, and um, I don't know, I'm not that ambitious, I don't really want to go out and buy skyscrapers, so I'm not, you know, uh, looking for that kind of career. Determined to steer himself away from the pin-up boy roles, 
he surprised everyone by turning down a string of high-profile roles, including Spider-Man. Heath's chance to prove he was much more than a pretty face came in true Hollywood style by lucky accident. At very short notice, he was asked to take over the role of Sonny Grotowski in the drama Monster's Ball, opposite Billy Bob Thornton. It was a small role, but pivotal to the plot, and it proved to his future collaborators that Heath was a genuine talent. Heath uh, was someone that we had wanted in the role. I mean, I, I had wanted him for a while. I saw something in him that was, he was very macho appearing, but there was something vulnerable about him. Then Larry saw him in Monsters Ball. I saw him in Monsters Ball, and I, the minute I, he shot himself, I left and, and said That's, that should be Ennis, if we can get him. But the superstardom and acclaim that would come with playing a closeted gay cowboy in Brokeback Mountain was still several years away. In 2003, Heath teamed up with Two Hands director Gregor Jordan to play another outlaw on the run. This time, his task was to bring to life the Australian folklore icon, Ned Kelly. He sort of found something as an actor that I, I'd never seen before and I hadn't actually seen before in him as a guy. You know, he kind of accents, accessed a darkness and, a, and, and I guess a sort of a, a rawness of spirit that, you know, was really important and really fundamental to Ned's character. Despite the fact that Ned Kelly would not find a release outside of Australia, Heath was rapidly becoming big news, thanks in part to his new relationship with Ned Kelly co-star and fellow Australian Naomi Watts, herself a rising star due to her Oscar-nominated performance in 21 Grams. Always ready to crown a new Hollywood power couple, the paparazzi trained their lenses on Heath and Naomi more and more frequently. Heath, though, was wary of becoming tabloid fodder and, as he reflected in late 2007, found dealing with all the constant media attention very difficult in his younger years. What's harder is, is um, you know, growing up through your development kind of years, like in, in front of the uh, spotlight, so to speak, like, you know, when you're in your late teens, early 20s, I think you could relate to this too. You're, you're, we're very impulsive and, and, and um, rebellious and, 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 you know. And so, therefore, I, w I was very much that way and very defensive and very guarded about my, my personal life. And, and it's just as anyone would be at that age, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, I was just as anyone else any other guy during that stage of his life was, except for in the media, you know, in front of the um, uh, public eye. And so it was kind of, it was documented, my development <laughs> as a human being. In his determination to take only the roles that interested him, Heath proved again and again that fame and fortune were way down on his priority list. In 2005, he turned down the title role in Oliver Stone's big budget epic, Alexander. Instead, he took a role in Catherine Hardwick's independent feature film, Lords of Dogtown. A fictionalized account of the rise of modern skateboarding into a global phenomenon, Lords of Dogtown saw Heath playing Skip Engblom, a long-haired anti-hero and social outsider who recruits local skateboarders to form a team and helps them on their way to eventual fame. He helped them discover this beauty, this creation, this creative side that they all had inside of them, that, like creating out of con from, you know, concrete, creating art from this concrete world that they were given. And this bleak, dark, gray world they just injected with color. His next film would bring with it a considerably larger budget and higher profile. However, in accepting a role in The Brothers Grimm, Heath's only motivation was the opportunity to work with the irrepressible director, Terry Gilliam. I was a big fan of Monty Python, and, and, um, and I so desperately wanted to be in, you know, uh, The Holy Grail and Life of Brian. I just, I loved it, and so I, I so desperately wanted to bring, like, a Python-esque kind of quality to Brothers Grimm, too, you know. Mm. So, you can't help it because his, his uh, sense of humour and just his nature is just incredibly infectious. 
Fortunately, the cult director had nothing but words of admiration for Heath and his co-star Matt Damon. Despite initial concerns about whether the pair would find the necessary chemistry to convincingly portray the brothers Grimm. I think that was a thing in some ways I was worrying about. How are these guys going to relate? And very quickly they just clicked. And they just found aspects of each other they could bounce on. It's fantastic. I mean, they're getting married next week, I heard. I love Matt and I loved working with him. And uh, he's a very, he's a generous person. He's a generous actor. Um, he's a fantastic tango dancer. In the fantasy epic, Heath and Matt played brothers William and Jacob Grimm, famous to this day for their enduring children's fairy tales. While the real life brothers Grimm were scholars and authors, Gilliam's fictionalized version takes a little poetic license with the facts and sees the pair encountering ghosts and witches themselves. Our telling of the Brothers Grimm story is it's a fairy tale. We've put them in a fairy tale. It's certainly not a, a you know, a, a autobiograph you know, biographic kind of piece whatsoever. It's, um, or, so it's a, it's a pure fairy tale. The Brothers Grimm premiered at the Venice Film Festival in 2005. It was to be a remarkable, if stressful, festival for Heath. Dealing with the demands of promoting one premiere movie at an international film festival can be tough enough. But at the 2005 Venice Film Festival, Heath was starring in not one, but three movies. Uh, it's, um, look, yeah, it's been really overwhelming. I mean, um, it's obviously a, an honor to have uh, the, my movies here and um, one movie, let alone I mean, to bear the responsibility of representing three movies. Mm. Um, it's taxing, you know, it's uh, exhausting. One of Heath's most appealing traits was his openness in interviews that exposed his vulnerability. Despite sometimes being distrustful of the media, when Heath talked, he talked with candor, often betraying signs that his emotional artistic temperament was at odds with the demands placed on him away from the film set when he had no alter ego to hide behind. I don't know where I am right now. I'm kind of floating. I'm having like out-of-body experiences <laughs> when I'm talking to people. And I feel like every sentence I say, I've, I've just, it was the same as the, the very last sentence I just said. And every word that escapes my mouth is the same word that just followed it and is about to, you know, it is, it, it's just very confusing and it's very uh, exhausting, as I said. Um, mm. But I'm, I'm trying as hard as I can to represent yeah, all three films with stamina <laughs> and you know enthusiasm. <laughs>
now in my life, so. At that moment in his life, Heath was in a long-term relationship with the woman who would become the mother of his child, Michelle Williams. Heath fell in love with Michelle when they worked together on Brokeback Mountain, the third film that Heath found himself representing at Venice that year. Starring together in the Ang Lee epic transformed both their lives and went on to affect a much wider impact than its producers ever thought possible. My life certainly changed from making Brokeback Mountain because I met... <laughs> annoying, right? <laughs> my, my, my life changed certainly from meeting uh, Michelle. You know, I've got, I have a family, a beautiful family and a beautiful, two beautiful girls thanks to Brokeback Mountain. So it's extraordinary the level in which my life has changed thanks to Thank that you. The film was based on a short story by Annie Prue. It told the unconventional love story of two cowboys who meet while wrangling sheep in Wyoming in 1963 and form a bond that transcends time and social barriers. As the director himself testifies, this was a film that no one expected to be the blockbuster it became. I want to do something small just to get over with my depression. and. Uh, I didn't know, I thought it's a small movie, a unique subject matter. Not many people will see it or care for it. Um, uh, I didn't know the results like, um, like this. Co-starring Jake Gyllenhaal as Heath's love interest, Jack Twist, Brokeback Mountain attracted widespread media attention with its unflinching portrayal of a difficult subject. I think just love is universal, isn't it? Um, and it can be epic. Um, so that, I, I just think it's coming, it's being told through the vessels of uh, two, two men. So um, that's why I guess it's surprising people. The movie did a lot more than surprise people, stirring up major controversy throughout middle America, where some of the more conservative cinemas refused to screen it. Soon everyone was talking about Brokeback Mountain, or as it was nicknamed, the gay cowboy movie. I try to avoid being seen as Western or gay cowboy movie, which just sounds funny. We're dealing with uh, a true love story of uh, realistic people in the West. It soon became apparent that Brokeback Mountain was a lot more than simply the gay cowboy movie. In particular, Heath's performance as the tortured Ennis Del Mar was garnering praise from far and wide, proving that Heath approached his roles not only with commitment and sensitivity, but also with a great deal of skill. I think the key was to, to treat it as a love story purely um, and to treat them as human beings um, and not as human beings with labels um, and very complex human being to, to add. I mean, my character was a, a highly complex individual that, that um, you know, had this inner struggle with his kind of his genetic structure his, that had been handed to him from his parents and um, he was struggling against tradition and, and their beliefs. Heath's portrayal of Ennis Del Mar was a finely tuned study of contradictions and repressed emotion. It was a performance that would draw accolades beyond his expectations and make him a worldwide superstar. Essentially he was um, a homophobic man in love with another man. Um, yeah, and so I had to, I had to, uh, I had to create uh, this this masculine, strong figure in order to kind of contradict the story too. And I, I really wanted to, um, and I had to do this through stillness too, because Ennis was very quiet, very still. Achievements like his portrayal of Ennis Del Mar don't come easy. Heath found shooting the film's love scenes to be particularly challenging. Yeah, it was it was very difficult. Um, there was no way to prepare for that. Um, it had to be uh, highly choreographed and th thought of, a plan. It was really preconceived. Every little move had to be because, you know, for obvious reasons, it was uncharted and it was uncomfortable. Planning and rehearsing aside, Heath found that the best way to tackle these sometimes confronting scenes was to abandon himself to his art and simply let go. I guess the way I, I got through it was, uh, you know, you really have to, and it, it's like this, I guess, for 
just acting in general or um, doing love scenes with a female co-star, as a matter of fact, Ed, you have to suspend reality and, and suspend your personal beliefs and uh, you have to really convince yourself of the environment you're in. Like any consummate actor, Heath found a way to channel the feelings of personal discomfort he was experiencing back into his work. I was lucky that my character was uncomfortable with it and knew with it too. So I could use my own level of uncomfort, you know, or discomfort, sorry. And um, so, so that worked for me um, because it was new and strange for me. So um, that. Um, so there was very little preparation that could be done. Um, and it just, we had to just do it and get, all, get on with the movie. It was just such a small part of this story in the end. The first accolade to be given to Brokeback Mountain stars came from the film's director, Ang Lee, who frequently expressed his admiration for Heath and Jake Gyllenhaal. Well, it's scary to me how young and good they are, actually. Uh, they're good actors, so they know what is involved. They read the script, they know my blocking, they know what has to be done. Mm, we don't rehearse those scenes. We talk about it, and then we just roll the camera, and, and I expect them to deliver, and they, they did. Perhaps a more pleasant part of the process for Heath was falling in love with Michelle Williams during filming. Cast as Ennis's wife, Alma, Michelle found herself constantly fielding questions about whether she felt nervous acting opposite her off-screen partner. Working with Heath? No, no, it, it makes me the least nervous. I wish I could make all my movies with him. The couple became inseparable, and in October 2005, Michelle gave birth to their daughter, Matilda Rose. Critical acclaim for Brokeback Mountain escalated into a frenzy of speculation as award season loomed. But rather than hitting the Oscar campaign trail, Heath and Michelle retreated from the spotlight and spent as much time as possible with their new baby. You know, we have a daughter at home, which is a beautiful dis distraction. Um, also, it's like, um, it's kind of, I feel like it's out of our hands anyway. I, I, I don't think, like, if you went out and campaigned and campaigned, if you, if, you, if you get awarded for that, then you're not getting awarded for your performance, I feel. <laughs> Honours and awards were coming thick and fast for Heath. In early 2006, the Santa Barbara Film Festival singled him out for a special award for breakthrough performance of the year. When I saw Brooke back, back in September, actually, at Telluride Film Festival, I thought his performance was breathtaking. I loved the film then, and I loved his performance. I thought it was one of the best performances of the year. And um, we had to have him, so we invited him then. True to form, Heath downplayed the accolade. Throughout his short career, he would constantly emphasize that he saw his work as being in a constant process of evolution. I guess I still feel like I'm breaking through. and I, Me personally, I don't think I ever want to feel like I have broken through and are on the other side. I want to continue to strive for better. And, um, but it's obviously an honor, and this is uh, really overwhelming. <laughs> As he told Variety reporter Pete Hammond after receiving the award, Heath's attitude to awards in general was to keep them at a distance and not give them undue emphasis. Through the whole award season, there's so much going on and there are so many different awards that it all becomes one thing. Um, it all just blurs into the same thing and uh, it's surreal and it's like, uh, you know, a real false sense of both success and failure at the same time. Like many actors, Heath was of the opinion that the craft of acting is so unique that to put one performance into competition with another is simply not the point. But he found that despite his personal views, awards were just another part of the job at hand. You're being thrusted into competitions, you know, and, and a race, and, and you're looking left and right, and all your competitors are actually competing in different sports, <laughs> you know, and you're all starting at different places, and you're not ending at the same line, and but you're all in the same race. You, you don't want to be in a race, but you are. And, <laughs> um, but tradition, you know, deems it important, and therefore it, 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 it's a great honor for us, and, and we're very grateful for it. Um, but I don't know, I think we're kind of trying to get through it, uh, stay calm and relaxed, and then it'll probably sink in later. 
The fact that he and Michelle were both contending with the same ordeal strengthened their bond. Both of them received Oscar nominations for their roles in Brokeback Mountain. Heath for Best Actor and Michelle for Best Supporting Actress. The, uh, the best part and the easiest part of uh, this whole season is the fact that we've been um, We've had each other's hands, you know, and, um, and it's, been, it's, it's been easier because we've been, we've been making it about each other. And, uh, Instead so of focusing on yeah, attention. It's much more enjoyable when it's about Michelle for me. The film gathered a total of eight nominations at the 2006 Academy Awards, winning three for Best Score, Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Achievement in Directing for Ang Lee. Heath didn't end up walking away with the statue, losing out to Philip Seymour Hoffman in Capote. But that didn't stop the scripts and offers from flooding in. However, after having three films released in a year and enduring a particularly gruelling award season, he was ready to start taking it easy. I'm in no hurry to go out and work right now. I, um... I think once this is all over and it calms down, um, uh, Michelle, Matilda and I are moving to Europe and we're actually getting out and we're going to travel around for a year. And uh, I haven't worked in a year and I'm not planning to work for another year if I can. Um, I'm just going to grow my belly and, <laughs> and bounce my daughter. Despite his best intentions, however, Heath found it hard to lead a quiet life. As Brokeback Mountain was premiering around the world, he came under scrutiny for his relationship with the media, with claims surfacing that he had allegedly spat at photographers. The claims were never substantiated, and Heath's own comments point to a much more relaxed attitude to dealing with the press. I've kind of developed a more diplomatic way of viewing it all and handling it, and I'm certainly more relaxed with it all. And um, um, But I, I, you know, I don't... You know, should the, the photographers following you and all that kind of stuff, it, it, that, you know, it gets... It's embarrassing more than anything, actually. It's just kind of embarrassing to be walking somewhere and have people jump out in front of you with cameras. And, but instead of kind of getting aggressive, I, I've, I've, um, I've taken the, the approach of actually getting to know them. Despite this, certain members of the Australian paparazzi clearly weren't interested in getting to know Heath. At Brokeback Mountain's Sydney premiere, several photographers squirted him with water pistols, apparently in retaliation to his alleged spitting. Well, we're just tired of uh, Heath spitting at us, assaulting us, so um, it's just kind of to say, well, you know, it's not very nice when you do to people. So it's our way of saying that we're tired of it, we're sick of it, and uh, I was spat at, assaulted, had my car door kicked in, um, you know, for taking a photo of him. And I mean, it's people like us that get him in the ratings, get him in the magazines, and uh, he's assaulted several other people, you know, and we've, we've just got to a point now where enough's enough, so it's kind of just saying, Heath strongly denied the claims that he had ever spat at or assaulted photographers. In an effort to put the incident behind him and remove his young family from the ever prying eyes of the Australian media, they relocated from Sydney to their home in Burham Hill, Brooklyn, New York. Immediately after Brokeback Mountain was in the can, Heath had made another film a film which carried a much smaller profile, but no less challenging subject matter. The debut feature for Australian theatre director Neil Armfield, Candy, saw Heath go from cowboy to heroin addict. I don't know, I don't think we went out, certainly not to make a political message. I, I like the fact that the movie doesn't uh, glorify heroin. I think it shows the result of heroin and its use and how it can destroy uh, situations, love. Candy is the tough and at times shocking story of Dan and his girlfriend Candy, played by fellow Australian Abby Cornish, whose lives descend into living hell because of their dependency on heroin. As usual, Heath stepped outside his comfort zone for some gritty research on the subject. We met up with a few people, like there was a gentleman that I spent time with who's has been and still is a junkie. He's been a junkie for like 25 years. And, um, and he taught us how to use all the paraphernalia and not on ourselves. He actually had a, a prosthetic arm 
uh, that that it, well originally they were designed for um, uh, you know medical use training nurses and stuff like that but they had one at this clinic for, um, where they teach kids how to actually inject drugs safely go figure in the case of candy Heath ensured that everyone involved in the production could benefit from his sometimes grisly research. And so he's taught us how to find the vein and, and the angle to slip the needle in. And, uh, and so, you know, and then we just watched him, observed him a lot. Abby and I, we, we filmed him and we made a little movie, you know, a documentary thing that we handed out to the production design team and the art department and Jeffrey Rush and just anyone else who needed to see someone shoot up heroin. <laughs> Despite the rumours of addiction to prescription medicine which surfaced after his death and theories that Heath's drug use had driven a wedge between himself and Michelle, while filming Candy, the closest parallel Heath could draw to the ravages of drug addiction was his one-time vice, cigarettes. I, I used to be a smoker, I was addicted to nicotine, you know, so I could <laughs> relate to it on that level, I guess. And But it's also like, what I was always thinking of, or would think of, is like if you're really, really parched, or if you're really, really thirsty, and you need to drink of water, it's kind of a very similar kind of urge. It's like that instinctual. It's like in your blood. You need it, or else you're going to die. That's what I've been told. So. It became apparent after Heath's death that drugs may have played a bigger role in his life than anyone but those closest to him might have realised. As Heath's own story has shown, even prescription drugs can be just as dangerous as anything illegal. I mean, I don't think it changed my view of people who are addicted to drugs. I, I, I'm definitely, um, I feel really sorry for them. It's a, um, it's a deep, dark hole. Uh, um, yeah, but there's nothing we can really do about it. Unfortunately, it's their battle. Sadly, it is only with hindsight that we know of the personal battle Heath may have been fighting. But drugs were not the only aspect of Candy's subject matter that Heath found confronting. I think I did more crying um, off camera, <laughs> you know, like it really, <clears throat> knowing that I had my daughter growing inside, you know, my girl. Uh, it, it, was, it was definitely uncomfortable holding a little prosthetic baby and looking at it and all bloody and it, it wasn't very nice. Heath's next film would explore considerably lighter themes than the dark undercurrents exposed by Candy. Directed by Todd Haynes, I'm Not There used seven different actors to portray different aspects of the personality of cult singer-songwriter Bob Dylan. Although they did not share any screen time, Heath's girlfriend, Michelle, also appeared in the film, which takes place across several different decades of Bob Dylan's life. I, I gotta everything. say, it was fantastic. <laughs> I'd never done anything like it. I'd never played anybody like that before. I'd never played anybody who was so out and out glamorous, and it was really, it was exciting, like the hair, the makeup, the wardrobe, the wig, the costume fittings, it was kind of thrilling. And my part is so small, so I wasn't, I didn't have to endure it all the time, which is probably why I liked it even more. Heath's interest in I'm Not There stemmed in part from his fascination with another enigmatic musician, Nick Drake. Heath aspired to direct films as well as act in them, and Nick Drake's story was one he found especially resonant. Um, for the longest time, I was obsessed with an artist by the name of Nick Drake. He, he died in the 70s, 1975, at the age of 25. Suicide. Um, and I was uh, obsessed with his story and his music and I pursued it for a while and still have still have hopes to kind of tell his story one day but it, they, it kind of died away, faded away because I it was a very mysterious figure and um, I felt like I would be taking too many liberties. While Heath's career was on the ascendant, however, his personal life was in turmoil. Rumours had been circulating for almost 12 months about a rift between Heath and Michelle due to his partying and drug use. In September of 2007, it was confirmed that the couple had ended their relationship. After the split, Michelle stayed in Brooklyn while Heath moved into a $23,000 a month loft in Manhattan 
the apartment in which he would be found dead only a few months later. Away from his partner and baby, Heath delved deeper into the party scene and was linked with a string of beautiful women such as models Gemma Ward and Helena Christensen. Heath, though, was reported to have found the split very difficult and apparently became increasingly depressed. Professionally, Heath had to turn his attention to an extremely physically and psychologically demanding role, arguably the role for which he will be most fondly remembered and admired. The role that would show us the morbidly dark side of Heath's acting talent, the role of the Joker in the Batman adventure, The Dark Knight. Um, I haven't, I haven't done much prep yet. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, three days away from working. Uh, I'm in Montreal right now doing the I'm Not There movie, uh, Todd Haynes' movie, and so I've been thinking a lot about that. But um, I, I got a few tricks up my sleeve. To prepare, it was reported that Heath locked himself in a London hotel room for a month and experimented with different voices and physical characterizations. Whatever he did in there, it worked. It, it's just been stupid amounts of fun. And, um, you know, he's, he's incredibly, he's dark, yeah, very nasty. He's a psychopath, sociopath, mass murdering clown. And, um, and it's really coming together. And the movie looks amazing. It's, it's a lot darker than the f first one. And, and I think a lot bigger too. Heath also derived great inspiration from his fellow cast members. As the Joker, Heath had the opportunity to work with screen legends like Gary Oldman and Sir Michael Caine. I don't know, a phenomenal, like working with Gary Oldman and, you know, which is a dream for me, and, and Michael Caine and Christian Bale, who even in a bat suit manages to, you know, give these amazing performances. And of course, Maggie Gyllenhaal and Aaron Eckhart and, Morgan Freeman, and, you know, it's just stupid. It's, it's an incredible cast, and, 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 and um, I, I, think, I think you'll... Uh, I mean, I'm pleasantly surprised, so I'd say you, you probably will be too. As proud as he was of The Dark Knight, sadly, Heath would never see the film's official premiere or the phenomenal box office success it went on to enjoy. Heathcliff Andrew Ledger passed away on Tuesday, January the 22nd, 2008, at his Manhattan apartment. The story was repeated countless times in the weeks following his death. A masseuse arrived for a scheduled appointment. Heath's housekeeper went to tell the actor of her arrival, but found him face down at the foot of his bed, naked and unconscious. As the news spread, the world was filled with shock and disbelief. Even those who did not know Heath were affected by the devastating news of the young star's tragic passing. It wasn't long before rumors of suicide began to circulate. Whether or not Heath's recent split from Michelle Williams had taken its toll, he had been complaining of insomnia due to the stress of work, causing him to take sleeping medication. It was said pills were found strewn about the room. As it turned out, there were pills, but nothing especially suspicious was discovered at the scene. Uh, the medical examiners uh, said today there was no criminality. Of course, you have to wait for the toxicology report. That could be uh, as long as uh, 10 days. Uh, there was some uh, issue about a $20 bill uh, that was found. There was a rolled up $20 bill found. Uh, no testing of that uh, bill has been done as yet. No suicide note was found, and it was reported that Heath had been his usual professional self only the Saturday before, while filming The Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus in London, a fantasy adventure film that reunited him with his brother's grim director, Terry Gilliam. It seemed that suicide was very unlikely. We, <clears throat> Heath's family, confirmed the very tragic, untimely and accidental passing of our dearly loved son, brother and doting father of Matilda. He was found peacefully asleep in his New York apartment by his housekeeper at 3.30 US time. 3.30 PM US time. We would like to thank our friends and everyone around the world for their well wishes and kind thoughts at this time. Once autopsy results were revealed, it was clear that Heath's death had been a tragic accident after all, and illegal drugs were not a factor. 
According to the New York City medical examiner, Heath Ledger died of an accidental overdose of painkillers, sleeping pills, anti-anxiety medication, and other prescription drugs. It's terribly sad, and I'm still stunned by it, uh, and still get chills when I talk about it. On the other hand, I think it's important to talk about it. I think it's important to honor Heath. The dark and gothic fantasy that is The Dark Knight would stand as a tribute to Heath and his commitment to his work. His chilling performance as the Joker was universally proclaimed truly remarkable, undoubtedly contributing to the film's worldwide box office take of almost $1 billion. It seemed to me to be very important that the performance that Heath had given us uh, get out there and be seen the way that he wanted it to be seen and the way he, he would have intended it to be seen. And what's very important to me is that I'm seeing audiences react to the character the way Heath wanted them to react to the character, and uh, I think he'd be very proud of that. Like his fellow Dark Knight cast and crew, Heath's Hollywood contemporaries were deeply saddened by the loss of one of their most gifted colleagues. Actors who had never worked with Heath but admired his craft offered moving tributes to the fallen star. Well, my heart goes out to his family and this kid. He's got a little kid. I don't know. Uh, you know, people have demons. Sometimes it's hard to see them. As Heath's performance as the Joker was becoming the stuff of Hollywood legend, talk of a posthumous Oscar nomination began to spread, with his co-stars leading the charge. I haven't seen a villain like this, or a bad guy like this, since uh, Dennis Hopper played Frank Booth in Blue Velvet. You remember that scary performance? I mean, that's kind of what it like. This out scares Hannibal Lecter. You vote for him then, come uh, award season? I bet. Would you vote for him come award season? Oh, I've single-handedly started a campaign, I tell you. Yeah, I think there's a posthumous Oscar for Heath, and, he, and he's got every chance of maybe winning it first, you know, since, since Peter Finch. Heath's death was a devastating blow to his family and friends. Oscars and Tinseltown tributes aside, to those close to him, he was simply Heathy, a down-to-earth guy who loved to surf and play chess, a loving father and a beloved son. Heath has touched so many people on so many different levels during his short life, but few had the pleasure of truly knowing him. He was a down-to-earth, generous, kind-hearted, life-loving and selfish individual who was extremely inspirational to many. Please now respect our family's need to grieve and come to terms with our loss privately. Thank you. After a memorial service at Penrose College in Perth, with a eulogy read by his friend and I'm Not Their co-star, Kate Blanchett, Heath was cremated on February 9 at Fremantle Cemetery. As the sun went down, the mourners swam in the ocean at Cottlesloe Beach, one of Heath's favourite hangouts. As well as the films he bequeaths us, Heath can be remembered through this portrait, painted by his friend, Australian artist Vincent Fantauzo, shortly before his death. Entered into the Archibald Prize for Portraiture in 2008, the work was voted most popular painting in the competition. Heath's been a friend of mine for uh, you know, five or so years, and I've been kind of trying to convince Heath to sit for a portrait for a while. Um, and this year, he felt comfortable enough with himself, and he rang me up and asked um, if I want to do it now, so I quickly jumped on it and flew down to Perth, where he was staying, and um, that's where we did our sittings. The portrait depicts Heath as a worldly, mature man, wise beyond his 28 years, but a man who is in constant dialogue with his own imagination and sometimes contradictory impulses. He had to always keep a lot, um, a lot inside, so here he kind of just opened up and said, here I am, and um, I guess the voices are him um, telling himself what to show and what not to show, and and uh, what to say and, and what to keep to himself. Despite receiving numerous offers for the painting, Vincent has elected to give the portrait to Heath's mother, Sally. Uh, the last thing he said uh, to me was, 
he knew I was kind of nervous about doing it and getting it done and I really wanted to get in and he said don't worry you'll get in and you'll win and he winked at me and he was almost almost spot on so I think he'd have a good laugh. Famous for his generosity it is fitting that Heath will also be remembered as a supporter of his fellow actors. A scholarship has been established in his name to assist young Australian actors trying to make it in Hollywood. Well, it's a scholarship that's um, in Heath Ledger's name. It's going to be a certain amount of money each year. Um, and, you know, actors are going to be invited to apply for this uh, thing. And um, as, as there's going to be some sort of selection process. And one of them's going to be chosen. And then they're going to be given an amount of money to cover their living expenses, you know, whilst they're here, sort of, you know, trying to survive as a you know, an emerging talented young act Australian actor in Los Angeles, you know. I think it's re like reflective and of, he of Heath Ledger's amazing career and the way that he, um, yeah, that he shaped it and, and how it changed and I didn't have the honour of meeting him personally but um, he's definitely paved the way for, for young Australian artists like myself. Heath's films stand as the legacy of an immensely talented actor who, at just 28 years of age, was only just beginning to reveal the depths of his skill. His disturbing depiction of the terrifying Joker in The Dark Knight and heart-rending portrayal of the clenched, emotionally closed Ennis Del Mar in Brokeback Mountain will be remembered always as masterful examples of the cinematic actor's art. Layered, meticulous, and above all else, full of emotional truth.